Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Applied AT Fireside Chat. My name is Nandy Mock, and I'm the founder and CEO of Applied HE, a new Singapore-based but globally-oriented higher education evaluation and branding agency. The topic of this evening's discussion is a very important one, sustainable development and research cooperation. And we're very grateful to our partner, Education Insight and our sponsors, the City University of Hong Kong and Universitas Erlangga of Indonesia for their support in making this webinar a reality. Next. Leading this evening discussion is a good friend, Dr. Janet Eva, who is also the founder and director of Education Insight. She's joined by an exceptionally strong panel of speakers from Malaysia and the United Kingdom, whom she will introduce to you shortly. Janet, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy, very much for the kind introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all joining us today. I'm Janet Ilieva from Education Insight, and I'm delighted to facilitate this distinguished panel of scholars and practitioners. Universities are at the heart of the world's most pressing challenges, and their contribution to sustainable development has received significant attention by policymakers, in university leaders, and the wider public. The most impactful achievements are built on strong collaborations and international partnerships, and this is the very area that we will be exploring together in the next one hour. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by our distinguished panel, which includes uh, Professor Abi Virekumarusevam. He is from Sunway University, Provost of Sunway University in Malaysia. He's co chair of the ASEAN Young Scientists Network and chair of the International Network for Government Science Advice Asia. Uh, Professor Abby is a University of Cambridge trained geneticist, educator and science communicator. He has won multiple awards, including the National Cancer Council Malaysia Cancer Research Award, the Merdeka Award Grant and Gentilist. In 2016, he became the first Asian researcher to be crowned as the best science communicator at the International Fame Lab Finals at Cheltenham Science Festival in the UK. I'm uh, pleased to be joined today by Ms. Helen Carlin. She's International Partnerships Manager at UK's University of Liverpool. She leads on partnership development with academic institutions in India and the Americas to support research collaboration and educational mobility. Previously, she was Chief Operating Officer for DFID, that's the Department for International Development, a Rebuild Consortium led by Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine addressing health system research in fragile and conflict affected states. She's also managed a number of research consortia based on health workforce development in Sub-Saharan Africa, funded by the European Commission. Um, Dr. Asmo Fahimi Kamaruzaman is an associate professor at Research Center for Arabic Language and Islamic Civilization, Faculty of Islamic Studies at the National University of Malaysia. He has studied across several countries and um, starting from the Yarmouk University of Jordan for his bachelor degrees and University of Wales for his master's and Putri University of Malaysia for his PhD studies. Since 2021, he's appointed as Deputy Executive Director for the Sustainability at the National University of Malaysia Strategy Centre. We're delighted to have you today, um, Dr. Asmo. And um, last but not least, I take great pleasure in introducing a long-term colleague who I've known for almost two decades, Kevin Van Kouten. He's principal consultant at the higher in higher education at the British Council, where he leads on the British Council's portfolio in the area of transnational education and higher education partnerships. Kevin has advised and developed higher education strategies for the Council across more than 30 countries. For two decades, he's been regularly asked to author articles on UK t &E student mobility and has presented at conferences on the subject all over the world. 
and I hope Kevin, you won't mind me giving this away. Um, is um, uh, Kevin is the author of one of the first definitions of transnational education. He's come up with it before most of us didn't know what TNE was. And um, without uh, any uh, further ado, I shall hand the flow over to our speakers. They all have between three and four minutes each, and possibly a bit extra if they need more time, to talk about the topic of sustainable development and research collaboration. And Avi, over to you. We'll start with you now. Yeah. Thank you very much, Janet, for this very kind introduction, and also to Mandy and Applied AG for really convening today's topic, which I think it's extremely topical. And I, I like the preamble uh, that was shared uh, in the call uh, for this particular uh, fireside chat, where it's really thinking about uh, sustainability development as, as really a third mission. Um, and, and for me, it is not just a third mission, it's really an all-encompassing mission. It's almost like a philosophy and a mindset, or really a you know, value that we need to imbue and, and ensure that at every decision making, every strategic process that an uh, institution makes, and this extends beyond an institution, uh, a higher education institution makes, has to take into consideration sustainability. And when we talk about sustainability, especially within the higher education institutions, I think a lot of dialogue has been about what is the future of institutions uh, uh, like the university. Um, and, and especially for private higher education institutions, uh, and also to a certain extent public institutions, uh, financial uh, uh, concerns and constraints that actually impact the sustainability of the efforts or the sustainability of the institutions uh, itself is a big consideration in which how a university operates and as a result serves uh, the, 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 the major stakeholder, i.e. the students. But I suppose in, in today's uh, fireside chat, um, probably, you know, it'll be easy to contextualize our discourse within the sustainable development goals that were adopted by the United Nations in 2015, uh, which is really a universal call uh, that aims to harmonize the actions of every person, if not every government, uh, to end the inequities that a lot of it's driven by poverty, as well as the need to protect the planet, and hoping that by 2030, uh, all people will enjoy that same level of peace and prosperity. Um, so I thought it would be you know, a great opportunity today for me to share some of the things uh, that Sunway University um, has initiated so that we be part of this harmonization effort. Um, and that's where the element of collaboration is um, to, to bring along uh, that agenda of sustainable development at a local setting. So at, at the university, we have institutionalized uh, the sustainable development agenda through three major initiatives or even institutions. The first one is the Jeffrey Sachs Center. And so the name itself alluded to our very strong connectivity uh, with Jeffrey Sachs, um, who was very much involved in the identification and development of his goals. Um, and then we have the Sustainable Development Solutions Network uh, Academy. Um, that I'll describe shortly what they do. And finally, the latest addition has been the Sunway Center for Planetary Health, led by uh, Tansri, Jeffrey, uh, Tansri Jamila Mahmoud, which really because an understanding that the advancement of humanity's well-being in the focus on sustainability, in the focus of trying to ensure development as well, um, the reality is the declining state of the planet Earth can no longer be ignored. As we think about ensuring our institutions are in a sustainable trajectory, we have to ensure that the planet that supports our whole existence is sustainable too. Um, and one of the only ways that we can ensure sustainability works is to ensure that the sustainability agenda is rooted on ensuring that the key stakeholders find our efforts relevant. And so really focusing on industry, because we know that science, technology, innovation, research can only be sustained if there is a socioeconomic benefit that's actually tied to it. And so, for example, um, the nice thing about Sunway University is that we are part of the Sunway Group conglomerate that allows for our not-for-profit initiative called the Sunway Education Group. But it also allows opportunities for us to closely interact and work with industry. And for example, um, currently, in supporting the SDG 12 Responsible Consumption and Production, 
We're actually working with our Sunway Parade Malls and the Sunway Lagoon to craft all kinds of proposals to send all food waste to recycling uh, projects um, across the city. We also work on trying to promote sustainable cities and communities through our collaboration with Lancaster University in our Future Cities Research Institute, as well as various different projects all across the city, ensuring that the university is not confined within, within its ivory towers. And then a really key uh, stakeholder that often we take for granted for um, and always focus on really complying with regulations, but not realizing that they are also a key group that we need to engage to facilitate and to help, and that's the government. So at some way, we work through the Sunway Center for Planetary Health, work very closely with mayors. And for example, in Ipoh City, they're trying to be the first city in the world to apply the donut economy model um, in and especially in Asian setting and see how that actually works. Um, in promoting SDG 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions, we also continue to cre create and provide various different seminars and for example, participate in today's fireside to discuss and disseminate all kinds of ideas and, and ideals so that we together can, can work towards promoting um, uh, that global harmonized discourse. And the third component of the stakeholder is society. You know, how can universities play a direct role rather than an indirect role that we know that we create future talent but the actual communities that live around the university, how can we actually work around? And so one of the things that our students uh, engage through the different community projects, but we also now have a concerted effort to drive various different agenda. For example, the healthy aging agenda, where we engage with different elderly societies in the city to reach out to various different groups, uh, independent of their social economic status, to try and engage them as part of that empowering of the silver economy. And finally, I wanna just share about our commitment to rethink about education. Because when we talk about the SDG four, which is quality education, um, it is given that we need to provide that quality education. But what does quality education mean, especially in the post pandemic? So we already have um, programs like the Masters in Sustainable Development Management, as well as the PhD in Sustainable Development Management. That's it's training individuals to be the next leaders in championing sustainable development. But sustainable development can only be in effect if everybody embraces it. And so with, we are thinking of various different ways how we can actually ensure everyone has the ability uh, and understands what they can do at their own individual level and try and affect that at a society level. So within the SDG Academy, we provide various different free online MOOCs that, uh, uh, that basically different individuals with different languages as well, which allows for different contextualization at an individual level. And finally, we can't run away from quality education and access. So at Sunway Education Group, thanks to the foresight of our Professor Elizabeth Lee, the CEO of Sunway Education Group, we are actually currently running a, a pilot program called the Future X KL42, which is a programming school where there are zero fees, zero teachers, and totally industry-led uh, industry programming uh, education that aims to train the next generation of programmers that have access independent of where they come from but are industry relevant when they actually leave us. And I, I really want to end uh, my initial spiel with that collaboration uh, uh, emphasis in today's uh, Fireside Chat. I know that you know, a lot of times we talk about our rankings and our ratings, and I know we are constantly told that no, the rankings and ratings are just another way for us to improve ourselves. But we know that ultimately these ranking and ratings are also used to compete uh, and to have, you know, and to celebrate our one upmanship over one another, to be able to compare. But I think when you think about the trajectory that we were pre pandemic and how unsustainable it is, we understand the value of competition still. But I think the people that are going to be the most competitive will be the ones that can collaborate most 
and to be able to support each other where we focus on better for all rather than better than all. And I think the real last and most important SDG that we really need to find better ways to unlock is the SDG 17 and looking at how more partnership for the goals. Because if we can unlock that, and we have seen that, and I hope today I learn from our other speakers who I'm sure they'll share, how different institutions are working together, not necessarily affected by the geological boundaries, but more motivated by the shared collective vision of having that global relevance, but also the local relevance. Thank you. That's, uh, that's fantastic, Avi. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your insights and bringing us back to the point. It's SDG 17, which is all about partnerships and working together and how can we build on each other's strengths. Um, I'm also quite um, taken by um, looking at what the SDG Academy does. And uh, I think um, the bit that um, I, I never really thought uh, about is the importance of embedding the SDGs in the curricula of students. And uh, I'm quite really pleased to hear that you actually have three MOOCs that um, are running already that uh, build awareness uh, about the SDGs. I mean, uh, on a very personal note, I'm on a journey trying to measure how universities are embedding the SDGs in their curricula and um, making some little, little steps in that space. But it is possible. I think it is possible. We can so definitely do much more in that space. And um, Next, from the SDG Academies and the SDG Goals, uh, over to a perspective from the University of Liverpool. Helen, over to you. Well, thank, thank you, Janet. And thank you, Abby, as well. Really interesting talk. And I'm, I'm very glad you ended on SDG 17 because I'm going to pick that up in, in my talk. <laughs> thank you. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk a little bit about a partnership that we have at Liverpool um, with um, institutions in Malawi um, as part of one of our, our institutional partnerships. And I think, as Abby mentioned, you know, it's kind of addressing the challenges set out by by the SDGs does require equitable and collaborative models, um, with that focus on on collaboration over competition. So SDG 17 is, is dedicated to strengthening global partnerships to achieve the targets of the, of the 2030 agenda. And the approach to partnerships is very important. The extent to, to which a wide range of stakeholders are included can impact on, on the knowledge, how knowledge is generated through research, how it's used and how it's accepted more widely. Universities have a key key role to play there as knowledge producers um, to engage the public in policy development, the wider public discourse in the home country, and also where the research is generated. It's not always in the country where a particular university is, and make sure it's, it, um, it's applied to add value. So as I mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about partnership that um, Liverpool University is part of um, in Malawi and how that contributes to sustainable development. Um, so that, that uh, partnership is the Malawi-Liverpool Wellcome Trust Clinical Research Programme. Um, I'll refer to that as MLW for short, because it's, it's a bit of a, a, bit of a, a long winded um, title. So the, the partnership um, works with uh, institutions in Malawi. It's a small country um, with help, many significant health problems, but it also has highly motivated scientists and highly motivated healthcare workers who work alongside international teams, trying to tackle some of the major health challenges that, um, that are faced in the world, including HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, pneumonia, um, maternal and fetal health. The MLW Clinical Research Programme carries that health research and it trains clinical and laboratory scientists uh, from Malawi and abroad. The programme is primarily located within the University of Malawi's College of Medicine with a separate facility at the Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital. There's also a policy unit in the capital, the long way. It's very much embedded the research with the healthcare system in Malawi and also with um, policy um, people as well in the, the capital. 
Established in 1995, the Wellcome Trust is a major funder, and that's critical really to enabling this, this partnership to work. It employs more than 200 people, including around 35 scientists, the majority of whom are Malawian. And it provides a world-class research opportunity for African scientists to build skills and capacity relevant to local context. And it's also an international center for, the, for major health issues that impact on Malawi and also beyond. The core aims of that partnership are the pursuit of cutting edge research focused on the health problems within the, the region, the provision of research based in a research based training environments um, for hospital laboratory and community based scientists, the development of globally competitive research leaders and the translation of scientific advances into human health improvements. And all partners are bought into to those aims. In addition to the physical infrastructure that's provided by the College of Medicine at the University of Malawi, that's necessary for the partnership to thrive, there are some other very important parts to that programme, one of which is a joint PhD programme that is awarded jointly by the College of Medicine in Malawi and also the University of Liverpool to support the development um, of researchers um, within the partnership. The collaboration and governance structure is also quite critical. So MLW scientists have access to the full range of, of senior scientists at the University of Liverpool and also at the School of Tropical Medicine. So they're able to capitalise on the, the institutional commitments that those universities have on global health research. With support from Liverpool, the institutions within Liverpool, um, the college also has a health research support centre that provides assistance and training for faculty members in grant application and management so that MLW can actually apply for its own research grants and that innovation is now being duplicated across the region as part of the Southern African Consortium for Research Excellence again funded by the Wellcome Trust. We've recently opened a new facility in the hospital grounds um, called Creator and that's that project has quite an ambitious vision for creating an environment for developing and emerging African health leaders and it's critical in training and retaining the brightest talent within the country and promoting a sustainable workforce in Malawi. It will also act as a hub for other international researchers, so for example HIV research programmes which are led by John Hopkins. So through the partnership, research translation and public engagement has been strengthened with positive impacts on local and regional health management. And just to conclude with some examples of the impact that that clinical programme has had, these include the testing of um, a vaccine for typhoid on the African continent to prevent typhoid fever amongst African children. And that's been followed by successful lobbying of, of Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines, and the Ministry of Health in Malawi to fund the national introduction of that vaccine as part of the routine vaccine vaccination schedule um, within Malawi. There have also been trial results for cryptococcal meningitis that have led to, to changes in treatment options in Malawi. And in the last nine years, um, MLW has trained 467 research candidates. That's from pre-masters through to doctoral level, postdoctoral level and 165 of those have been PhD level. So that all of that is only possible because of the equitable partnership between the University of Malawi, the two universities in Liverpool, and the long-term external funding from the Wellcome Trust. So it's a very strong example of research cooperation cont contributing to sustainable developments and quite a good example of, of SDG 17, so Partnership for the Goals, in action and I think that that's where I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. It's quite impressive to hear um, how your partnership is moving from strength to, to strength and I'm quite uh, really taken away by the numbers. 165 doctoral researchers trained mm -hmm. on joint programs is, uh, is, is remarkable. Uh, do they, uh, are they remotely trained? Um, or um, do they have to spend a period of time in Liverpool as part of their programme? Um, it, would it would depend on what, what their PhD is, but it's a joint programme. So generally with joint programmes, people spend time in each institution. 
Right, fantastic. And they're all, they're funded by the Wellcome Trust. Um, yeah, as the, part whole, of it, is. the whole partnership is funded through the, through the Wellcome Trust, um, but it's, it's possible within that 165 PhD students, you will have people who are funded, you know, through, through other routes or people at Liverpool who might start a PhD and then go out to Malawi to do something very specific, um, funded through one of the UK funded research councils. Right, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll get the chance to hear more about it as part of the Q&A session. And um, again, from the partnerships at the University of Liverpool, we shall move back to Malaysia. Um, Dr. Asmo Fahimi, over, over to you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, hello and very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm from the National University of Malaysia or UKM. For the uh, preamble, I would like to give uh, an introduction about my institution, which is known as uh, UKM. UKM is a comprehensive uh, university that was established in 1970. Uh, so this year we are celebrating our 52nd anniversary and uh, UKM is one of the five research uh, university in Malaysia, which means that uh, we are getting additional funding from uh, government to carry out uh, research activities. Actually, uh, we are in the university. So the main focus and the job of the university is to create a new knowledge, to publish an outstanding academic books and article, and also to teach the student. And at the same time, we also need to focus on sustainable development as well as the research uh, cooperation. Uh, in order to do that, I believe that the most important thing about the sustainable uh, development, because we are talking about the sustainability, if we don't have uh, sustainable funding, it's a very difficult for us to sustain resources, to sustain activities and to sustain the research, to ensure that uh, what we are targeted uh, can be successfully achieved. So in our experience, in our university, we have a few endowment fund in our university one of these is the money that we receive from Sindabi Foundation, uh, which is a charity wing for Sindabi company. Uh, Sindabi is a, one of the biggest corporate company in Malaysia that focus on the palm oil and uh, uh, property development. So let me tell you what is the meaning of uh, endowment. By definition, endowment is a fund that was given by a donor uh, that is managed by university so that uh, they can carry out their activity in perpetuity, meaning that they can have uh, quite continuous uh, funding uh, resources. So uh, there is a question on how we manage the money. Of course, uh, we have an agreement and signing ceremony and blah, 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 uh, because uh, the total money is about the 20 million ringgit. <clears throat> but uh, the most important thing is how to manage uh, the money. What uh, we have done is uh, we manage it through the concept of endowment fund, uh, where the capital fund uh, we receive, we invested uh, to the relevant uh, finance authority, authority, and we only use the dividend for our activities, uh, uh, such as uh, research, uh, community, as well as to promote also the world sustainable development as followed to the United Nations 70s SDGs. Like, uh, but uh, we also uh, focus uh, in this, this chair uh, endowment, we also focus, only focus on the two major issues pertaining the zero waste and the climate change. So this uh, project, we start uh, since uh, 2010 and the total amount of the funding that we receive and spend for the first uh, 10 years ago is uh, slightly more than uh, 34 million ringgit, which is equivalent to 7.5 million uh, US dollars. We use uh, this dividend for the research grant, uh, scholarship for the master and PhD student level, and also for other activities uh, pertaining the issues of uh, zero waste and uh, climate change. So this is one of the concept of our uh, sustainable development and research cooperation in our university. Because uh, you know, Janet, eh? uh, because uh, anything is not about the money, but uh, without the money, we cannot do anything. Thank you very much. That's great, thank you. It's always refreshing to be reminded that the research collaborations yeah. uh, 
heavily depend on sustainable funding. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Asmo. Mm. And um, now we will complete today's discussion with a global perspective from the British Council to find out how their research contributes to the sustainability agenda. Uh, Kevin, over to you. Thank you, Janet. And it's really good to hear some of the, uh, the case studies from, from different institutions. Uh, uh, this, this evening, this, this afternoon, I'm going to give you a little bit of a broader sense of how a public body like the British Council can facilitate and contribute to the SDGs through supporting higher education research partnerships internationally uh, and more broadly. So just to give you a, a little bit of an introduction, the British Council, or the British Council, uh, we are the UK's cultural, relations agent, cultural relations agency and we promote cultural understanding and encourage cooperation uh, by working uh, around the world and influencing policy and practice, building lasting partnerships, building capacity and promoting mobility and exchange of students and academics. So we have a, quite a broad role within the higher education space and we understand the global importance of the SDGs and the impact our work will make to their delivery. And also, uh, obviously, the wider role that the UK has to play in the implementation of the SDGs. So we have this kind of uh, overarching role to, to look at how we can facilitate higher education partnerships to support the SDGs. So just to give you a sense of some of our projects which are actively supporting the SDGs, these range from uh, projects which are working with individuals. Um, so we have a programme looking at, for example, active citizenship, we work in civil society, um, in, in, at schools level, through connecting classrooms to discuss and, and, and debate some of the uh, important SDGs and how they relate to the schools level, uh, schools level engagement with pupils. We run programmes supporting global social enterprise, our skills, programmes around justice, um, and then quite large programmes in the area of science and international partnerships, all of which have to some extent um, you know, SDGs uh, are, are integral to a lot of this activity. And just to give you a, a very specific example, uh, the British Council um, uh, delivers on behalf of the UK Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy what we call the Newton Fund, uh, which is a fund which builds research and innovation partnerships with part partner countries to support their economic development and social welfare, and to develop research innovation capacity, uh, supporting long-term sustainable growth. So very much looking at the SDGs and how and, and the fund supports uh, in the science technology areas uh, institutional partnerships which contribute to sustainable development and growth and capacity building. Uh, the fund is delivered through, uh, through the British Council and other UK partners and the UK government invested quite significant amounts of money, uh, hundreds of millions of pounds uh, in this fund to support the SDGs. So I think you know, it's this kind of project, this is just one example where the British Council is there to facilitate um, these kinds of partnerships. Um, I think the main, the main outcomes of projects like the Newton Fund and others are that what, what we're trying to do with them is to support research that has the ability to lead to a positive impact on the lives of people on low incomes, contribute to economic development and social welfare, welfare of the partner country. So as you can see, that's, that's a very, they're very broad aims, but then within each individual fund, we look very carefully at how these aims are being met uh, with the partnerships that we fund. Um, the British Council has also done quite a lot of work or significant amount of work looking at how uh, the um, SDG 5 and gender equality in higher education. Uh, we, this year, we published quite a significant research piece which directly addresses how the British Council is contributing to improve gender equality in higher education. Um, we do this through a number of, of interventions at policy level. We support institutional partnerships which promote gender equality, for example, uh, looking at professional development, so leadership, training and skills uh, for women in, in, in countries where they're underrepresented at senior levels in universities. We look at student mobility and we provide insight and analysis on this area. Because I think, you know, 
this is one good example of where we can drive um, the funding of partnerships to support a, a very significant issue around gender equality in, in, in many of the countries where we work. I mean, the, these goals are universal and relevant in every country. Um, and I think particularly in the fields of science, technology, engineering and mathematics, uh, this is in, in many countries, women are underrepresented in these areas. So all the projects we support really try and encourage um, the infrastructure, the curriculum, uh, the engagement with industry and access for women to particularly research and PhDs in STEM areas. So this is just another example of some of the sort of broad work we do to support the SDGs. Um, another piece of research which uh, actually I've been working on with, with Janet um, looks at the, the value of transnational education in general, um, including research partnerships. And one of the interesting findings from this piece of research is, is the way in which transnational education partnerships contribute to the SDGs. Uh, we, uh, Janet, on behalf of the British Council, uh, managed a survey where we asked uh, a, a large number of institutions to report to us on uh, which SDGs their international partnerships were contributing to. And we found that they actually cover 15 of the 17 SDGs. Uh, we have a bank of case studies where we've got a lot of detail on you know, some of these partnerships and how they've contributed to, to SDGs, and particularly uh, the SD, SDG 4 on quality of education, uh, but also quite a lot on gender equality um, and on partnerships for the goals. So we're starting to see that you know, international partnerships, um, as they organically develop, are contributing quite clearly to a range of the SDGs. So, I mean, all of this leads me, I think, to summarise by saying that the value of international partnerships, research and teaching partnerships can be quite significant for host countries in relation to um, contributing to the SDGs, because international partnerships can do a huge amount to improve the quality of higher education, teaching and learning. They can increase supply of higher education. Um, they can enhance internationalization, enhance research capacity. Crucially, they can enhance graduate employability uh, directly uh, relating to the SDG around decent work, um, and they can build sustainable communities. So I think broadly the British Council is there to facilitate these types of partnerships. Um, and similarly to the example where Liverpool obviously have funding from the Wellcome Trust, the British Council works in this area to support um, institutions who are looking to really focus their energies around the impact and value of their international partnerships um, and very much looking at some of the, some of the SDGs I've already covered. So that's broadly the role of the British Council in all of this. Um, happy to to continue to take questions and, and carry on with the debate. Thank you. That's, that's great, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, if I can abuse my position as a chair, I would also like to extend the call that um, we've put out. It's a call for case studies. Uh, everybody who is working in the space of uh, international partnerships and uh, your partnership directly contributes to the SDGs please get in touch and we'll profile your case studies on our uh, portal. There is a portal dedicated uh, to SDGs and uh, partnerships. Uh, I will put my email address in the chat option, but uh, do email us. It will be fantastic to hear from you and profile um, further uh, this area of work. And um, I would really like to thank wholeheartedly uh, our incredible panel, uh, Abby, Helen, Asmo and Kevin, uh, thank you for your fantastic contributions. And um, now the floor is uh, over to you. Do raise your hand if you want to come in and uh, make a comment um, or share your experiences um, in um, international collaboration and uh, how it contributes to sustainable development. Um, or if you feel shy, do use the Q&A um, option to ask your question or just um, pop your question in the chat option. But uh, understand the format of this event is um, that um, if you raise your hand, I'll upgrade you as a speaker and you can join the panel. 
and um, as a panelist, you can share your thoughts and perspective. Um, we can't wait to hear from you. Uh, however, if you do feel shy, I do have quite a few prepared questions to ask. And um, I shall probably get on with it. Uh, my first uh, question to I'm sorry, our... uh, Janet, yeah. there's a hand raised. Oh, there is a hand raised. Um, right. I Let me find out straight away what that might be. Okay, it's um, Aina and Urgaliev. Uh, Aina, I think I managed to upgrade you as a panelist. Do you want to join us? Yes, uh, I would like to join. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation for this wonderful panel. Uh, I'm calling, <laughs> I'm from the University of uh, Almayu. It's in Almaty, Kazakhstan. So you guys are more welcome to uh, come to Kazakhstan and visit us in Almaty. Uh, we are right now working on a research for uh, social trust. Uh, it's an Edelman trust barometer method. Uh, we did it last year and uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Ah, nice, nice. So uh, last year we did the, uh, this research in Kazakhstan and we found out that uh, people, uh, it was related with the government, uh, medicine due to a pandemic. And we found out that the, our uh, people, public, they don't trust uh, government, don't trust um, our med uh, medical institutions uh, because of the rates of the people who were sick. And then in January, there were uh, riots in our uh, country in different cities. And the biggest hit was in Almaty, uh, January. So this uh, research was really indicating that something, there is a spring of the, uh, in the society. So we are doing it a second time this year. And then we are seeing, uh, is there any changes? Are there any changes uh, in the society and the public trust? So if somebody from the, you know, your universities want to join and we can collaborate, we can share the method and then the questionnaire, uh, and we can compare how it's happening in, in your country and our country. That's, a, that's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining in. And uh, yes, we'd definitely love to visit you in Kazakhstan. That'd be amazing. I, I suppose I can respond uh, very quickly, uh, Einar, if, if Janet, if that's all right. Yeah. Please do. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, Einar, thank you so much. And I'm so glad that you actually brought uh, the, the issue of trust. And, and, and certainly, I think... Um, there is a significant uh, uh, trust deficit. And I think um, across all uh, different sectors, uh, we, I think the current global data suggests that um, the education sector, the academics, uh, the trust in academia, the trust in science, although it has dipped, it hasn't dipped as much as for example, the trust in political leaders and political systems, uh, including even religious and leaders and societal leaders. Um, and, and so um, although there has been a trust deficit, um, it's very interesting that um, there are very different trends. Uh, and uh, I think this whole perception that um, average data, you know, uh, is, is actually relevant across the world is not. So I, I think your, your project is very exciting. And I would certainly love to hear about and uh, uh, both in the context of Sunway University, but also within the International Network for Government Science Advice, uh, which I chair. Um, you know, one of the, the, the really important uh, areas that we haven't spoken too much today, which is about how do education institutions that are not only disseminating information, but also creating information can be effective knowledge brokers uh, in communicating, uh, you know, in this, sea of misinformation and disinformation. Uh, and, I, and I know for a fact that our British Council has got many different projects uh, on, on trying to promote uh, the ability for the academia to bridge uh, these gaps. Uh, but I think some baseline data and understanding, um, you know, this trust uh, 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 landscape uh, in, in different ecosystems, different geography uh, would be interesting. And I, I would love to hear uh, more about your instrument that perhaps we can can translate. Yeah. 
Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. I think we've got quite um, a few uh, questions. Um, there is one from Anishan. Anishan, do you want to come in and um, ask uh, ask your question live, or I can read it for you? Um, I'm not sure. I will. Uh, hmm. Nishan, you're on. Okay, yeah, sorry. Um, I just was unmuted now. Um, I was just going to ask, I'm curious, you mentioned 15 of 17 SDGs covered in your survey in the UK. Um, I'm curious which ones were missed out um, and if they're underrepresented. Of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw your question, I've just checked. Um, it's actually, and, and it's a, it's only, I think there were 27 case studies. So, you know, we're bound to miss a few, but uh, the two were, life on land and life below water but where we didn't get specific um references to them being uh worked on through the partnerships so i think you know all of the others uh, were mentioned um so i think you know that those two are probably the you know unless there's specific research projects on those areas you wouldn't expect them to be so i think you know we can say we've got nearly 100 percent coverage there um uh so yeah i think it's a uh, it's as we get more case studies, I'm sure we'll build a, build a better picture. But but it was really interesting that quality of education, um, decent work, uh, sustainable communities, zero hunger, no poverty, they're all covered by many of many of the partnerships. Um, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. We've got um, uh, another question, which is um, about uh, the website of the impact case studies. So I have just put that above in the Q&A uh, function and uh, also in the chat um, function. So you can see um, the uh, URL for the website and uh, do please uh, feel free. We'll really love to hear from you and um, to submit case studies uh, should you have anything that you want to share with, um, with the world. Um, we've got um, a, a question from the Indian Institute of Technology in uh, Kandinga. I'm probably mispronouncing it. Uh, Anup, do you want to come in and um, uh, you can um, you can uh, share your perspective? I'm not sure I can actually. Oh yes, I can see you. Uh, you're on. Sorry, I'm, I'm I'm getting there, trying to figure out where to find you. And how to how to upgrade you, Anup? You're on. Hello. Hi. Hello. My name is Anup Chandra, and uh, I think from IIT Gandhi Nagar, any research project can be joined. And anybody interested, you may mail, and then I can locate the <coughs> <coughs> professor and get in touch with you for doing any type of research or joint program in India. Thank you very much. That's, a, that's a fantastic, uh, Anu. Thank you very much for uh, coming in. Janet, um, uh, I have uh, one question uh, to Prof. Abi. Can uh, I raise up? Yeah, please do. Uh, and just, no, just uh, uh, what, what I want to know the, the, the best practice in the Sunway University. Uh, can, can I help you? Can? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Prof. Abi, uh, just uh, to know what is your best practice in your Sunway University, how to, uh, in terms of governance, how to apply all the SDGs, uh, 70s SDGs. Yeah, yeah what, I think. Yes. Is there any policy uh, that we can be the guardians to your university? To your university? Yeah, so from a group level, um, I think uh, it's really good that uh, even the government of Malaysia is um, really applying what is called the ESG um, you know, framework uh, that really helps to govern um, you know, very much the, the practices and also incentivizes um, institutions to actually embrace that. So, um, so the, 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 the Sunway group as a whole has actually embraced uh, you know, the ESG and actually has set certain uh, benchmarks or scorecards for each of its uh, different entities. 
Uh, but as a Sunway Education Group and the Sunway University, of course, it's a bit different because our ecosystem, you know, the university is, you know, 9,000 students strong. And, and so, you know, you have a different uh, uh, stakeholder to actually uh, manage this. Um, so for me, the, the best way for governance is both on a top-down and a bottom-up approach. Um, from a top-down approach, basically, uh, we have very clear uh, guidance uh, on um, a whole umbrella. And so we have what is called the Sunway Campus with a Conscience, uh, which basically has delineated for each of the SDGs um, what are the different initiatives and what are the current benchmarks and where we want to grow in the next three years, five years, seven years, and, and, and 10 years, right? Um, but we actually know that ultimately as a university, it's not also about our practices. It is about how our students will leave our university and actually go and practice this philosophy of sustainable development in whatever they go. And that's, that's really the power of what higher education institutions are. And so that is what um, you know, Janet um, you know, sort of mentioned. Um, it's how can you make it mandatory? And so you know, the nice thing about um, you know, in Malaysia, we have MPUs, um, which are common subjects that are compulsory for every student in the university to take. And universities are given some flexibility to choose what themes. And we have chosen planetary health and sustainable development to be made compulsory subjects for all our students. And we also make sure that the students have to show a tangible demonstration of their impact. And I think, um, you know, uh, Dr. Asmo, uh, yes. academia, we are very good at measuring, but I think a lot of our measurements are surrogate measurements, like publications as the only marker of research excellence, when actually that's not tangible, that's just countable, you know? And, 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 and so- Humbless. It's the same thing with, with sustainability. It is how many people did the students reach? You know, how did we affect the behavioral, the attitude change in, in, in these initiatives? So it's really a top down and, and so And I think the governance of sustainable development cannot just be a, a document or a, tech, a, a box that, you know, for us to tick, but it's about really embodying it. And that, that's what we are trying to do. And, and, and hopefully uh, it will make that change. That's, that's fantastic, Kavi. Thank you very much. And can I bring Helen here who hasn't answered any questions yet Thank and you. just uh, invite invite for a perspective from the University of Liverpool. Um, okay. I mean, it would be fantastic to have health yeah. embedded in the curricula of all students, uh, isn't it? But how do you do it? Um, that, that's a good question. At Liverpool, we, we do um, have something called a global citizenship hallmark in our curriculum. Um, which is is very very much related to to the SDGs and um, to the to the students having an appreciation of um, it kind of learning about the, the sort of impacts on the world and how they take that on you know into the future after they've left the university. So that that's um, developing within the curriculum at the moment. Um, we're also a signatory to the SDG Accord which higher education universities can, can sign up to. Um, so there are various criteria within that um, as well. So I think if, if you're, you're looking at kind of governance mechanisms, um, that's quite a, a good thing to, to sign up to. Um, in that if, if the institution signs up to it, then things can have to happen at that institutional level. Um, so I would, I would suggest perhaps having a look at that as well. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. And uh, we do have quite a few uh, people that want to come in. Um, so we shall start with Gulam and then go to Adira and um, uh, Badraya uh, in this uh, order, perhaps. Um, Gulam, do you want to, to come in? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I mean, for putting, uh, taking me into the loop, you know, uh, I'm a practitioner, basically, and formal vice president, Pakistan Policy Institute, USA. Uh, I mean, uh, I want to point out here that this sustainability development goals by the United Nations, you know, in this regard, saving the planet um, is very important. And it, it has taken uh, world over gains momentum after recent devastating floods and landslide in our country. 
So I, my, my question is, you know, I mean, it should be taken internationally and, uh, and the institution, they, they should come forward, you know, uh, in uh, what you call it, uh, 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 saving the planet uh, uh, sustainability development goals from that point of view. This is what I want to draw the attention. This is my question, is, you know, and in, especially British uh, uh, Council can play a very important role in this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gulam. Pakistan has been in the news and uh, we are all very saddened to hear about the devastating impact of the floods and the disaster, how disastrous they've been uh, in, in the country. I shall take uh, uh, the other two questions and perhaps uh, then ask the panel to respond. Um, um, they all have the chance to, uh, to get uh, back uh, together on that particular issue. Adira, would you like to come in? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gulam. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Stay safe. Uh, my pleasure, you know, participating in this uh, uh, very uh, interesting, you know, and uh, informative uh, seminar, you know, you have been conducting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Adira, do you want to come in? Um, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. Um, so shall we sell a safe idea for a little bit later and to go to Batraya, Batraya Khalil? Well, good evening from my side is Batraya and uh, currently I'm heading the Department of uh, Applied Linguistics in one of the public sector universities of Pakistan. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to appreciate this effort and uh, to me it's a kind of unification like what Sir Ghulam has just mentioned, that this is a kind of a thing where we are actually moving towards a sustainability development, of course. Well, um, this is not a question, uh, in fact, but a concern from my side that uh, the thing that I've noticed, um, um, this post-pandemic uh, taste of research, which is very much there. And uh, I have actually noticed that, you know, the students, the undergrad and postgrad students have started shifting from a real life research to a descriptive one. And this is quite alarming because uh, the kind the research gap that, you know, the COVID-19 that is there just because of COVID-19 is actually required to be bridged up. And I feel that there are a less number of institutions who are paying attention towards this side of pandemic as well. Uh, so if there is any suggestion or if there is anything that we could actually go for a kind of a partnership or kind of, I would love to leave my email address uh, in the chat box. Thank you. Yes, uh, yes, please, please do. And um, I think uh, we are running out of time, uh, but um, there is also a chance um, for all the panelists to share some uh, final thoughts and um, also respond to our colleagues from Pakistan. And um, shall we start, um, uh, we'll start in reverse order. Kevin, shall we start with you? And um, some of the participants actually addressed their questions to the British Council. So on behalf of the British Council, <laughs> and on behalf of Kevin Van Couter, would you like to offer some responses? Of course, yeah. Well, I think the, the one, one question was around the sort of the global, the global climate climate emergency. Um, you know, the British the British Council is very much involved in again facilitating and supporting partnerships which focus on this area. We have some specific projects and programs looking at this in in a number of countries in South and East Asia. So I think you know we uh, the British Council is very aware of the of that, that responsibility, and I think. Um, we also see the value of international partnerships in, in supporting and uh, enabling debate around these areas, you know, all of the areas that I mentioned and climate in particular. But just to generally, generally to sum up, I feel like, uh, you know, organisation of the British Council, we have a relatively small role to play, but we, we do our part to in, try and ensure that, you know, uh, where international partnerships 
really can make a difference and contribute to the SDGs. We, we do our best to facilitate and support those. We don't fund them all, but we work to ensure that they happen and we work with governments to, to try and encourage these types of partnerships at, at a policy level. So um, hopefully we're making a contribution as, as to agencies, similar agencies in the UK and in other countries. And I think collectively we can make more of a difference. That's, uh, that's great, uh, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think um, uh, Asmo uh, might have lost his internet connection. Uh, so if you're back on, Asmo, do you want to come in? Or I shall go straight to Kevin. Ah, there you are. Fantastic. Yes. Uh, internet is back on. Thank you. I think uh, we need uh, international partnership eh, in order to enhance uh, the SDG, all SDGs. And uh, in uh, our university now, we are still working eh, on the industry, on the public, on the community and the university. And the one, the most important thing now, uh, we are build uh, the garden of uh, sensibility. We are provided a sensible community bonding space, urban, urban fam farming education area for the basic gardening, hydroponic, uh, composting beans, rain harvesting system, and uh, free fresh produce for uh, university community. It's a very, very good uh, experience. Uh, we can uh, also uh, teach uh, for the student eh, to, uh, to, to provide a sustainable uh, space and urban farming education. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Asmo. Helen, any final words? Thanks, Jana. Um, yeah, I mean, just as, as regards uh, partnerships go they're critical and very very important in terms of achieving the um all of those, those sustainable development goals i think what what's quite important to consider though is um if you are sort of entering into a, a partnership to address a particular challenge that you've got a very kind of clear focus as to you know what that partnership is going to be and what's um the mutual beneficiality um if that isn't a bit of a mouthful for, for each side um, in order you know, for it to work effectively. So you've got to have a clear focus, there's got to be a kind of complementarity um, of skills. Each side has to bring something to the table and that there's got to be um, a focus, um, a clear focus. And, and in, that, in that respect, you'll end up with a more equitable partnership and partnerships do need to be equitable. Otherwise they, they're not partnerships really. So that, that's just that kind of fi final conclusion. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Helen. Good to be reminded about the importance of equity in any kind of relationship. And uh, Avi, you have the last word. And I also wonder whether you want to address uh, our colleagues from Pakistan and um, what they shared with us, saving the planet was on their agenda. Yeah, I, I actually, you know, Helen, you, you actually just took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> Mutualism and um, equity. Uh, and I think, um, you know, it's just very, very um, heartwarming to hear uh, the, the different um, additional uh, perspectives from our counterparts from uh, Pakistan, as well as India, and, and that we heard from uh, Kazakhstan. Um, is this sincere and genuine appreciation um, a lot of times when you think about partnerships, uh, we think about how it's going to benefit a particular institution or how it's going to benefit me. What is in it for me? Uh, but I think, um, and a lot of times when, you know, I think when I first started in my relationship with British Council and the various different initiatives, it's always like, oh, British Council or the UK partner is going to help us. But I think um, the sustainable development goals and what it actually creates really helps to calibrate this inequity in our own mindsets. Um, and I think, um, you know, just listening to our participants and the desire to actually, um, you know, want to collaborate, I would actually say that they also equally need to frame their, their mindset um, as we embark on this next stage of collaboration post-pandemic. We have to realize that while the Western world or, you know, the most more developed countries um, are certainly a, a partner in developing this, um, they are not doing us a favor. It is in their favor that we actually develop in this part of the world because this development that we are trying to achieve in a sustainable manner is also critical towards their sustainability. And I think that level of empowerment from you know, this region and these groups of uh, people for all kinds of reasons that are you know, at this moment in time, product of the current inequities need to be empowered 
need to feel that they are equal partners uh, because even if they don't benefit the other partner directly, we know that they are much that everybody is going to benefit. Just like what the COVID-19, the virus does not distinguish the boundaries. So will climate change and all the different existential threats. We need to be able to be on that same plane. And I'll end in that. Thank you. That's, uh, that's fantastic, uh, Avi. Thank you. Thank you. On um, ending on a, on a high note. And... Um, I would love you all to join me in thanking our stellar panel and um, thank them all for their fantastic contributions. And um, that's um, Abby, Helen, Asmo and Kevin. I thank you very much for being with us today and sharing your insights. And a huge thank you to the Applied HE team, uh, Mandy, Simon and Peter. And above all of you who joined us, wherever you are, and um, joined the discussions from, from the comfort of your home or office. Uh, and at this point, I shall hand over to Mandy. I am Janet Ilieva, and it was a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you everyone for the very interesting discussion. I hope you've all enjoyed it. Please allow me to express my deep appreciation to our wonderful speakers and Janet for their time and contributions. And also thank you, our dear participants, for joining us for this third fireside chat of the year. The next fireside chat is scheduled on 7th of December at 8 p.m. Singapore time. And the topic is in pursuit of the best models for international student recruitment. So we hope to see you again for this one. Another regular webinar that is alternating with fireside chats is Squaring the Circle Debate. And the next Squaring the Circle Debate is scheduled on the 2nd of November, 2022, with the debate theme, Unpaid Internships for Students Should Be Banned. Both our webinars are always on the first Wednesday of the month and always at 8 p.m. Singapore time. We also organize on behalf of universities, bespoke webinars, where we will undertake all production, branding, and marketing, etc. Here's a good example. We are organizing a series of exciting masterclasses jointly with the City University of Hong Kong, and so far we have completed three webinars. The fourth and last one is scheduled sometime in December, so please look out for our emailers. We've just launched in February this year, the Applied HE Private University Ranking ASEAN, and we're now in the process of preparing the Applied HE Private University Ranking Asia Pacific to be launched in 2023. The Applied HE Private University Ranking is tilted towards teaching and learning and employability, which are the main strengths of private universities. Now, we all know that private universities are often highly innovative, high quality institutions that serve a large group of students, but they're often undervalued in other research heavy university rankings. So we are evaluating private universities based on their key strengths, and we hope to shine a light on this often overlooked sector. For those of you with a deeper interest in the rankings, I highly recommend checking out the Applied HE Private University Ranking ASEAN Showcase publication, which contains ranking tables and overview of the methodology, ranking commentary by some of our panelists like Dr. Kevin Downing and Dr. Richard Holmes, as well as Professor Professor Elizabeth Lee of the University. You can download the ASEAN Showcase now from our rankings page on appliedhe.com. Graduate employability or GE is a key concern among higher education stakeholders, including parents, students, and the government. Now this is still work in progress. We put a lot of focus on graduate employability, which is why we aspire to present the graduate employability index in each individual country. Right now in progress are these five countries, South Africa, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, and Saudi Arabia. And in the pipeline are Taiwan, Indonesia, Hong Kong, Azerbaijan, and Kazakhstan. So if you're interested to be our local partner for this project, please contact us. For branding strategies, we are in the process of developing an Applied HE Super App. We have Future, it's the first of its kind, an online networking platform created specifically for the higher education sector. An alumni CRM, 
Um, so now you can keep track, manage, and email your alumni from near and far of news and happenings of your institution anytime, anywhere, all backed up with data and all on one platform. We also have a news website called Extra Extra, now indexed by Google News. You can disseminate news and information about your university to your global peers and stakeholders. So far, these three sub apps are ready and have been launched and it is a complimentary service for you. So it's in your interest to take advantage of them. The next sub app still in development stage is the mobility and exchange app. When this app is ready, it will be the perfect tool for your faculty, staff and student mobility and exchange, be it on a national, regional or international level. More sub apps are in the pipeline and they're all related to higher education like universities, courses, student recruitment, summer schools, jobs, internships, scholarships, research, professional training, lifelong learning, and a whole lot more. Our aim is to provide a one-stop platform for all your higher education and beyond needs. We also have three evaluation tools, which also double up to meet your benchmarking and global branding needs. We have the all-round job ready rating to evaluate the quality of teaching and learning and employability of your graduates. It's organized around 22 employment clusters. So what this means is it can put a spotlight on every program that you have. The job ready rating is the silver bullet that meets your institution's quality assurance and branding needs. We also have an English ready rating to evaluate the quality of English language instruction in non-English speaking countries. It's also a great marketing tool for the recruitment of international students. And the online ready rating which helps your institution benchmark and promote its online programs and courses. These tools can translate into affordable strategies for global branding and marketing of your institution. And last but not least, as you know, we are the new kid on the block, we still are, and we're very grateful for all the support that we can get. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our very supportive sponsors, to the sponsors of Squaring the Circle Debate and Fireside Chat, City University of Hong Kong, Universitas Erlanger of Indonesia, and Education Insight of UK. And to the sponsors of the Private University Ranking, ASEAN, my deep appreciation to APU, Asia Pacific University of Technology and Innovation Malaysia, City University of Hong Kong, and Sunway University Malaysia. A big thank you for all your valuable support given to Applied HE. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. This is the end of my presentation. Um, I'd like to thank you once again for your attendance and I hope to see all of you at our next webinar. Bye for now. Bye, Janet. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank Goodbye. you so much. Have a good evening Thanks, or good morning, <laughs> wherever you are. Thank you, thank you so much, Janet, Mandy. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you too. All the best. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.